Cole. Back out to LeBron, high left side, inside two minutes now. LeBron drives to the basket, off the glass, got it up and in, and his headband knocked back, and he'll go drive anyway. It doesn't happen by itself. Anybody remember that guy, LeBron James? Yeah, his team just kind of walked through the first round in the midst of all of this craziness. One of the wildest days of the NBA, not just on the floor but off. We'll talk about it, give you a new coaching candidate, and do a film study on the basics of greatness. It's all coming up on today's edition of Tip-Off. Hope you're good. I'm David Locke. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I appreciate your time. A uh, huge thank you to everybody. I did a podcast yesterday with Pelton. Just picked up the phone, called him. We're going to go 30 minutes. We end up going an hour. Honestly, it's one of the better things I feel like we've done. Uh, it's kind of all over the map. It wasn't particularly well prepared. Uh, and then we got into our mutual research projects we're working on. I, I really I thought it was good, but I want so I strongly suggest Cat re watching it. And then I want to thank all of you because so many people already have hit at K Pelton on Twitter and thanked him for doing the podcast. It makes a huge difference. And actually, after we actually talked for another 30 minutes after the podcast, and that was one of the things he said. He, he had just done the Zach Lowe podcast, and he had mentioned that the response was incredible. Zach has like a million followers. Uh, it's on Grantland. I mean, it's a big deal. And he said, but you know what? No one thanks me like the Jazz fans. So uh, if you get a chance to send that thank you to at K Pelton today uh, as well, I'd really appreciate it. Please take a second and listen to it. I thought it was great. Uh, there's also a double podcast up of when I did shows with uh, DJ and PK as well as with Spence on Friday if you want to, and then uh, I might throw up my Scotty G interview from Monday as well. We've got a lot of stuff today. Let me re let me set for you where we're going, and then you can kind of pick it up where you want to. Uh, here's what we're going to discuss. Last night's games, Donald Sterling, uh, coaching landscape, excuse me, uh, draft prospect that's gotten hot, coaching landscape, uh, and then a new coaching prospect, and then we'll do a film study. So that's the plan for today's show. Appreciate you tuning in. Sorry we're delayed a little bit. I had to run around and get some things done for my lovely daughter. All right. Uh, last night, Atlanta hammers Indiana in Indiana, goes up 30. Roy Hibbert is the scapegoat. Four fouls, no points, no rebounds, one block, and an assist. Yet, when he's on the floor, they're even. So what's happening is Hibbert's not playing well. They're going to their bench, and their bench is not picking up where Hibbert left off. Uh, and what's stunning to me, and I talked about this earlier in the series, is that Atlanta's bet starters were really the problem for the uh, Pacers in the series. But last night, it was Mack, Corver, Lou Williams, Mike Scott, and Elton Brand who were outscored them 23-10 in seven minutes. Um, so it's uh, it, it's a sign, really, that just I think everything's wrong in Indiana. It's it's a colossal mess. It could cost Frank Vogel's job. Then I think we get into an interesting circumstance. One, I don't know if Vogel would want to coach. I don't know what his contract status is. But do we want him? Uh, clearly, this thing is falling apart. He's at the helm. Is he responsible? He's gonna, you know, obviously Indiana's going to blame him. But are we interested in suddenly getting Frank Vogel with his defensive background, his developing of young talent? Possibly. Uh, his, re his background is coming through as an assistant coach, uh, as a video coordinator, and maybe we're finding that some of his lack of experience is uh, showing here in this moment. I don't know. It's a, it's a really interesting concept as we venture into what a the next head coach of our franchise is going to be on what works. I mean, it's a really fascinating, it's almost worth taking some time and looking through the models of past coaches and saying, okay, what is successful? You know, I think we generally know college coach to pro is not successful. Is D-League coach to pro successful? Is video coordinator through the system successful? Is ex-player assistant to head coach successful is X player iconic player just straight to coach successful is TV booth to coach successful uh, what is the pattern of success is there 
a pattern of success in coaching. Uh, it's it's very interesting. One thing I think we've all said to ourselves over the years, there have been kind of two things that have become spoken most often. One is college coach to pro coach doesn't work. Okay, that does seem to be true. Iconic superstar player can't coach. Really? Are we sure about this? Larry Bird was pretty good. Magic Johnson was pretty bad. So maybe it's just Magic Johnson can't coach. Um, what other great iconic players have tried to coach and have they been successful or not? And you know, where does a Jeff Hornacek, a Jason Kidd, I think Jason Kidd's a pretty iconic player. He's been pretty good. Uh, Jeff Hornacek's probably not quite that much and he spent some time as an assistant. Mark Jackson, you know, he's number three on the all-time assist list. Uh, it's pretty hard to say that he somehow is is not one of the iconic great players in the league. So what happens? is Do great players just step in? Is that actually true? Uh, I'm not sure that that is true, frankly. Uh, we, we've got the goal. It's, a, it's an interesting project. It probably is something we should all be working on or thinking about as a Jazz fan uh, right now. Uh, the other one last night was San Antonio was just smooth as could be late in the game. That'll be our film study tonight. Uh, today they they just you know they got outscored in the fourth they got rattled a little bit Dallas actually outscores them in in the f fourth second half last night 53 to 43 uh, to come back in that game but they just smoothly rolled uh, through that and got the got the win uh, and now are back in control of that series and probably win it you know they may win that in six and then. They're back on pace. Then they get the winner of Portland-Houston. They probably work themselves to the conference finals to play an Oklahoma City team or a uh, Clipper team if the Clipper team can get through what they're in the midst of right now. Um, so it will, it will be interesting to see uh, what happens. Miami sweeps last night, and then there was an interesting quote from Mickey Arison, their head, co their owner, saying there's a 100% chance LeBron, Wade, and Bosch will stay in Miami. I'm still going to throw it out there. I'm going to throw it out there again and again. I think there's a chance these guys take $12 million and that Carmelo takes $12 million and they rebuild this juggernaut, and it becomes they just start working their way to one of the great dynasties of the game. If you're watching right now on the Google Plus uh, page, you can submit a question, uh, and I'll try to get to it a little bit. Donald Sterling Day, at noon hour time, so in about three hours, this may have come down by now. I don't have any answer of what I think is going to happen. I think it's going to be very significant. The outroar has been enormous. The sponsors have stepped away. And the singular comment of, it comes down to really one line here, don't bring them to my games. That really, we can get distracted by all sorts of other items. Uh, maybe the only pertinent one is when you back up the track record of doing business in a racist fashion as Donald Sterling has and you couple it with the singular line of you don't have to bring them to my games. Uh, it's over. You can't. It's over. Um, that's That I think is is really what you need to know. Uh, on this, and I don't think there's a lot of room to go further. The other crazy story uh, is what's going on with the Warriors, and I've known this story. We were there the day it happened. I've actually known the story, but I didn't have uh, authority to break it, or I would have broken some confidence to break it. But the story is uh, the assistant coach that got fired by the Warriors the day we were in there at the end of the season because he was taping all of the conversations in the uh, coaches meetings of players uh, <clears throat> throughout and it was a violation of company policy so he got fired but what is going on with the Warriors that their coach feels is the need to tape all of the conversations or I'm gonna this is I, I'm speculating here but that assistant coach who did that was hired by the owner from his time with the Celtics you can decide whether you want to put two and two together everything indicates Mark Jackson will not be back in Golden State next year, which then gets the coaching landscapes interesting. What happens if Doc Rivers doesn't return to L.A. for the Clippers? Uh, Frank Vogel doesn't return with the uh, Indiana. Stan Van Gundy's already out there. Uh, what happens with Scott Brooks in Oklahoma City? And suddenly, you know, there's a lot of jobs. There's a lot of good jobs. Every time one of these opens, it's another good job for somebody else. I wonder if Doc Rivers leaves the Clippers job, 
uh, I, I, which I don't think will happen, frankly. I think I think silver will come down hard enough today on sterling that it gives Doc Rivers a vehicle to be able to stay. I think Doc Rivers letting it out from Adrian Wojnarowski yesterday for, uh, that he would possibly not return. I think is a very very smart move by Doc because let's go with the scenario that Doc does leave the Clippers job because he can't work for this man because he's racist. Who possibly takes that job? Nobody does. Like, it's not, nobody would fill the job. I, I don't know what they would do. Somebody would have to fill the job, but whoever's filling the job is basically coming out publicly and saying, I'm willing to work for a racist when Doc Rivers steps away, which forces the NBA's hands, if nothing else, for all the reasons they want to deal with race, you know, rid, rid themselves of a racist. The NBA needs to rid themselves of the racist because the 14 clients have come through and said they're no longer going to stay with it, but also... Also, the fact that, just think about it, if Doc Rivers steps away, uh, who coaches? One other note I would make on the, this whole Donald Sterling thing, I wasn't going to go there for this, but I think one thing that's a misnomer a little bit is people saying, well, the players knew what they were playing for. I don't think that's true. And then also actually go look and see how many players actually signed this free agents or were traded there in some capacity, uh, which really means that they didn't choose to play for Donald Sterling. They got moved there. Or they got drafted there. Um, so the coaching landscape is wild right now. We're in the midst of a coaching search, but there's a possibility that you could have Indiana open. There's a possibility that you could have the Warriors open. Not even a possibility. I think you're gonna. I think both those are likely at this point. Minnesota, New York, Detroit. Uh, there's other possibilities. There's other coaches. Uh, I've been surprised when I hear, and I don't know where we fit on that list of things, but I think it's worth. Um, uh, I think it's worth kind of keeping an eye on it, and I think it impacts how we do the search and then back to the next step of kind of who we're, we're looking for. Uh, I'll do my coaching for Coach of the Day here in a second, but Dario Sarek, the uh, Europe, top 10 European draft pick, had an incredible weekend. Uh, he won the Adriatic League. He's the MVP of the league. He in the final four of the league. He's 20 years old. He... Uh, pulled an upset. His team was not favored at all. He carried his team. He averaged 22 points, 13 rebounds, 6 assists, 3 blocks. He shot 8 of 16 from behind the arc. He afterwards said, before the game I said that we will come here like Olympiacos did as underdogs and become the EuroLeague champion. You can say that I was born a winner, but I believe that you are producing a winning mentality on your own. In my case, when I was 12, I got that spirit. I believe that I will win each game. A little ass to him. I like it. Uh, in three or four weeks, approximately, I will know where I will play next. Whatever I decide, the NBA will always be my dream. All guys who are in the draft this year, Parker, Wiggins, etc., would not be able to do what with this team what I did this season. So, uh, pretty awesome comments. Tells you a little bit about him. He played well. Defense is a major issue for him, uh, but he does seem to have an all-around offensive game. Um, worth kind of keeping an eye on an interesting player for sitting if we end up sitting at five or six he probably gets serious consideration uh, and you remember the likelihood is we do end up at five or six uh, in this process all right let's look at our coach of the day our coach of the day is Jay Laranaga uh, who is the son of the Miami head coach George Mason head coach the great NCAA coach who is a very analytically strong coach by the way kind of has taken the forefront of analytics in the collegiate game uh, done a lot with Miami. Uh, Larinaga is in his second year as the Celtics coach. He worked one year under Doc Rivers and now one year under Brad Stevens. Prior to that, he played 12 years in Europe after coming out of Bowling Green where his dad was the head coach. He's 39 years old. He was the head coach of Erie Bay in the D-League for two years, had success as a D-League coach. And then again, you have to ask yourself, do D-League coaches have, is there a track record that D-League coaches, minor league coaches, have success in the NBA? The initial, uh, the initial word seems to be yes. It seems to be pretty strong um, in that regard that that is taking place, that they do have that um, kind of success. He, I think I said he played 12 years in Europe and he's been with the Celtics for the last two years. Um, so he's one year with Doc in the Thibodeau defensive system and you'd have to quest, ask yourself whether or not that works. I am not a big believer in coaching trees. 
Uh, but I would say the one thing that seems to collectively work year in and year out is the Van Gundy slash Thibodeau defensive system. Uh, when those coaches, whether it's Ron Adams, who's an assistant, has bounced from, whether it's uh, the the young the coach in Phoenix who went with Hornacek, whether it's Steve Clifford in Charlotte, those coaches who know that defensive system seem to universally have been su successful defensively uh, wherever they go. So Jay Laranaga is today's coach for you to consider along the way. All right, let's uh, answer some questions and then get to film study. Uh, first from Lane. How scary would the Clippers be with decent ownership group? No, there's no question. Uh, Donald Sterling not only is a racist, but he's cheap and hasn't been willing to spend the money in the past. Uh, they would definitely be a powerhouse with every uh, ability to uh, to do things. Um, Lane, with his next question, now that it's fairly obvious our asset accumulation mode is over or soon to be completed, what is the chance we make a play for an established star or just past their prime, i.e. Chris Bosh? Well, I don't think our asset accumulation is necessarily over. I think we have accumulated a lot of assets. I think we could accumulate more assets if – I think we are beginning to be primed and prepared to make the next step where we actually build the franchise up to become – uh, to, be, to be better and to win and to do some of those things but uh, and to start the process back up. But I don't think that that's guaranteed because I'm not sure that the landscape will allow us to do that. And uh, so therefore I think there's a, there's a chance that that will not happen yet, that uh, we almost could continue asset accumulation for another 12 months prior to um, – Prior to being able to kind of start building up, we, you know, you know, it's it's basically when do you go try to find the Kevin Love or that type player who you bring in and you sell Utah to him? I thought the comment from Dennis Lindsay at the end of my interview with him on Locker Clearout, we need to start selling Utah to people, and what I think that means is you're going to have a hard time selling the free agent, but I think that you've got to be able to bring a player to your roster, let them see the passion of this fan base, feel where Salt Lake City is an easy, pleasurable town to live in, the weather's not that bad, the fans care, you're very important here, and that you pro and if marketed right, you still can get your endorsements and sell the player that it's worth being here and staying. You know, the problem with, with Kevin Love right now is it's only a year, it's probably too short, so can you find the, you know, who's the next guy on that list that's going to want out of where he is that maybe we can add to our to our grouping. All right, let's do a little film study here. And really, I'm doing very basic today. I just thought, uh, I just thought these two plays were beautiful. They're basic. Sometimes I think we get carried away trying to want to do um, too much, and you know, we always are looking for the awesome plays. Um, I I do think what Atlanta's doing with Indiana, the way they're spreading the floor, and maybe they have no choice but doing anything else. But I think it's, I think it's very very good. Um, but I I wanted to just go to the two game-winning plays of the San Antonio Spurs uh, last night. There were two things that jumped out to me, the, the value of a veteran team, the calmness and collectedness of what they're doing, uh, the value of having a, a fa fabulous point guard at the controls as well. Um, I, you know, it's this is very basic stuff, but I think that there's um, – there's really something to it. So let's go to it. Here it is. It's 2:10 left. San Antonio 85-84 and we pick it up and it's a basic early on here. It's a basic pick and roll. I've muted the volume of of Joel Myers. It sounds almost it's almost like you need a little of it. It sounds kind of weird. Uh, it's a basic pick and roll at the top. They get the switch. So they they know what Dallas is doing here. They're trying to set it up. They've got the switch. Uh, now, they, Dallas does a nice job, switches back. So this is kind of a busted play now where you can see that they didn't get entirely what they wanted. So they go into their next sequence of movement. Kawhi Leonard and Faye Kanoff out to Ginobili. It's all busted up. Everything's not working here. High pick and roll. They get the switch this time. This is what they were trying to get a moment ago. They didn't get it. So Ginobili drives, steps back. Mrs. Butt, because they got that switch, because they stayed in the play, got the switch, worked the second option, what happens? But Duncan is now being guarded by Marion while Dallin Barrett is out on Ginobili. So Duncan gets the inside position and gets the rebound off the miss. It's very subtle, but because they ran through their entire sequence of their play, because they didn't freak out uh, and force it, because someone didn't go one-on-one, -on -one, because the Spurs are so comfortable together, they were able to get the offensive rebound. Now what do they do? Do they need a timeout with 152 in a one-point game? 
Nope. Duncan just calmly brings it out to Parker. Parker checks over at Popovich for the sign. And now they get into their early action, a set play, where it's a fake pick by uh, Duncan because they don't want Marion popping out and switching on Parker because uh, Marion can handle Parker. So he sends a feign pick, doesn't really impact Devin Harris at all, and Duncan's going to clear the area. Now the second pick comes from Splitter. Now, interesting, this is where you got to give Dallas a lot of credit. They deal with this pretty well. Nowitzki goes with Duncan. They actually did a, a bottom. I mean, this is actually pretty complicated stuff and pretty well orchestrated by both teams. Nowitzki was on Splitter. Marion was on Duncan. But they actually, Dallas actually switches it. Now Nowitzki goes down with Duncan. Marion is now on the pick. So Dallas actually was able to kind of get what they want, but Marion doesn't play it aggressively. Parker steps into an elbow jumper, and it's good. Now, if we back all the way up on this play, there's a really important thing to see here of where this worked. Remember the initial switch that San Antonio got where Dallin Bear ends up on Ginobili. If you're watching the video, you watch Parker come across. This player right here, this defensive player, should be clogging this lane probably a little bit, causing Parker a problem, but it's Samuel Dallin Bear is still switched out on Ginobili from this play. And Dallas is still mismatched based off of the initial picks that the Spurs made on this play before the offensive rebound and never got switched back, and that means that Parker gets the elbow. Dallin Barrett playing at 16 feet and uncomfortable is unable to get out, and it doesn't know where to step in. Parker gets the open look and buries it. Really, this is a veteran team knowing what to do. It's also a veteran defensive team. If we go back and watch it from the beginning here, here's before the first shot. Where they set it up, you know, this play is busted, and they get the pick, and Duncan takes Marion with him. And now, at, from the 155 mark on this play, where Ginobili's driving, <clears throat> you have Dallas with mismatches, and they never are able to switch out of these mismatches uh, here. And now they get into the second part of the play. We're watching it again. The fake pick. Duncan goes up. And had the Spurs, also, by the way, worth noting, had the Spurs run a Duncan Ginobili pick and roll, it would have brought this thing back around. Um, you know, brought this back around, and then they could have switched it back, but the Spurs don't make that mistake. So really just that's the fundamental calmness, the brilliance, the subtlety inside of a play. And then let's go to the what was really the game winner, 87-87. Uh, game so it's now we got a minute left no timeout again these guys are veterans they've played together a million times D. Allen Parker play on the French national team Ginobili Duncan Parker have played together for world Kawhi Leonard's in the right so, so first thing is the spacing the Spurs are perfect with this stuff right they've got Manu in the left corner <clears throat> they've got Leonard in the right corner and the left corner and Manu will be very important Watch Diaw here. He's directing where we want to run this thing. So Duncan goes and switches, bringing Dallin Bear over to this side on the play. Diaw now goes to set the pick on the left, high left, perfectly timed. The pick is set. Parker explodes. Dirk, who's not a very good defender, is now covering the area. Slides down nicely. There's no wing help because Leonard's in the right corner. Monte's not going to leave him. Look over on the far side at Marion just face guarding Ginobili, which becomes important. And Diaw astutely pops back. Duncan is holding his ground in the right dunker. Parker brings all the defenders to him. Nothing's open. What do you got to give up? Frankly, this is pretty good defense by Dallas. It's you got to give up something. The Spurs have spaced it perfectly. Diaw, if he rolled, Dirk could probably handle it a little bit. Dallin Barrett is 
guarding and cutting off the lane and being able to get to Duncan. The three-point shooters are guarded except for Boris Diaw. And, you know, it's interesting here at this point if you're looking at the screen. In the old days, <clears throat> what would have happened is Marion would have probably played in between these two guys, gone to Diaw. Diaw then rotates to Ginobili, and the question is whether Dirk can get to Ginobili in time, which then is a mismatch. And if he has enough time with seven seconds on shot clock, he drives by him. But now you stick to corner three shooters, and this is the open shot. And Diaw buries it. So that's just kind of – that's actually a good example of where we are in spacing in modern basketball, um, and it's very, very well done. Interesting day in the NBA. Let's see how it plays out. The two crazy stories um, is the Warriors coach being fired for taping all of the conversations and uh, the story, obviously, with Donald Sterling. Also, at 538, there's been a really interesting piece that was run about – um, fouling and intentionally fouling and whether it works or not. So um, you might want to go grab that. Some interesting stuff at 538. All right, have a great day. Enjoy yourself. Thanks for tuning in.